Greetings and welcome to the Quarles and Brady webinar, Developments at the National Labor Relations Board and their impact on employers and franchisers. My name is Judy williams Kalaki. I'm a partner in the firm's Labor and Employment Group, and I serve as a chair of the Labor Group's National Labor Relations Act team. I represent employers across diverse industries, and I provide employment law advice to clients regarding the full range of labor and employment matters. Today, I have the pleasure of co-presenting this webinar with uh, two attorney colleagues of mine who are also in the firm's labor and employment group. Chris Nichols provides counsel to employers in wage and hour issues, or counsel to employers in wage and hour compliance issues, uh, counsel on discipline and discharge, leave and accommodation issues, among other matters. He regularly advises franchisors and franchisees regarding employment issues arising in their industry. Chris has extensive litigation experience and is a member of the firm's class action defense team. Uh, Steve Cruzel also advises companies across industries on a wide range of labor relations and employment issues and defends them in courts and agencies against charges of discrimination and retaliation. He also conducts investigations and complaints of wrongdoing or policy violations and counsels employers on legal obligations across multiple states. We are all pleased to be with you today. Um, hopefully you can hear my voice, but I cannot hear your voice because we are in listen only mode. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about a few of the housekeeping items so that you um, can make sure that you can ask questions and we will be able to get to them and answer them. With regard to CLE credit, we will be applying for one hour of CLE credit. If you are an attorney and would like to receive CLE credit for attending today's program, please fill out the CLE form located at the back of the PDF copy of materials that are found in the handouts panel of the webinar dashboard. Once again, those materials are at the back of the PDF copy of materials that are found in the handouts panel of the webinar dashboard. You can complete the form and return it to Meg Smex. Uh, Meg's contact information is also listed at the bottom of the document. Once again, we have muted all phone lines for those dialing in and for participants listening to audio via computer, so you will not be able to speak to us. Um, we also would like you to be aware that this presentation is being recorded and an electronic survey will be emailed to you after the program. Now, what about those questions? Well, if you have a question, we will still be able to answer it. Uh, please type your question in the questions box located in the upper right corner of the webinar dashboard and submit. Uh, the conference host will then be able to make sure that we receive the message and every effort will be made to answer questions in the final minutes of our time together today. So without further ado, why don't we get to the presentation? Uh, before we get into the actual topics, I thought it'd be helpful to go through a roadmap of what we're going to be discussing. The first area that we're going to talk about is recent board appointments. Um, so that you can get an idea of how things have changed, hopefully for the better if you're an employer. Um, we're also then going to talk about joint employer standard, as you may or may not be aware, Browning Ferris, which was a big decision under the Obama board, was recently overturned. We're gonna talk about what happened and what that means for you as employers and franchisors. We're also gonna talk about some other recent board decisions, including in the area of employee handbooks, micro units, and unilateral changes to terms and conditions of employment when there has been a past practice of making such changes. We're going to end before our Q&A session by talking about the general counsel memo that was issued on December 1 of 2017 and what that might mean for the future of uh, cases and priorities under the board, board's new general counsel, Peter Robb. So there have been quite a few changes at the board in the past year. And just for background, the board is typically comprised of five members. They are appointed by the president to five-year terms and need to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, if you look at the presentation materials, you can see that under the Obama administration, there used to be five um, incumbents, and those five incumbents no longer are at the board. Philip Muscamara retired um, or resigned uh, his term on December 16th, 2017 at its conclusion, and Kent Hirozawa and or Harry Johnson's uh, terms expired before then. Mark Gaston Pierce, however, and Lauren McFerrin remain at the board. Um, the board 
typically is comprised of three uh, individuals from the party of the president and two individuals from the other party. The two individuals from the Democratic Party at this point are Mark Gaston Pierce and Lauren McFerrin. Uh, Mark Gaston Pierce is actually in his second term, uh, which expires later this year on August 27th, 2018. Lauren McFerrin is uh, said to be there for a few more years. Her term expires in just under two years on December 16th, 2019. The changes we have seen at the board include three appointments in the last year by President Trump. <clears throat> it took a while for him to start to make appointments, but when he did, um, he made them all in pretty short order. Marvin Kaplan was sworn in on August 10th of 2017. He is currently the chair. Um, Philip Miscamara, whose term expired, um, was the chair previously. And with, his, with the expiration of that term, Marvin Kaplan was appointed chair. Uh, he has experience as chief counsel to the chairman of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. So he's familiar with how agencies work. Um, his uh, background is uh, the uh, anomaly, however, compared to the backgrounds of the other appointees that we have seen. William Emanuel um, was sworn in on September 28th of 2017. He was previously a shareholder with the law firm of Littler Mendelssohn. John Ring is the latest appointment. He was appointed um, when the Miscamara vacancy occurred. Uh, his appointment occurred earlier this month, January 12th, 2018. He has not yet been confirmed by the Senate, so he is not yet on the board. If he is confirmed, there will be a three-member Republican majority once again. Um, his background is similar to Emanuel's in that he actually has been practicing in private practice for 30 years. He is at Morgan, Lewis, and Bakke is currently and co-chairs that firm's labor management relations practice. We don't expect there to be much problems with his confirmation. There has been some pushback lately, not really due to anything by him, but due to uh, some issues that happened with uh, William Emanuel after he was appointed. Um, as Chris is gonna be talking about the joint employer standard passed under the Obama board, or enacted under the Obama board was overturned um, in December and Emmanuel sat on the, uh, the panel that issued that decision. As part of his ethics agreement, Emmanuel had agreed not to sit on and to recuse himself from cases involving a number of his clients. The High Brand case, which overruled Browning Ferris, uh, did not involve any of his clients, but they sure had issues similar to the uh, company in that case. And after that uh, decision was issued, a number of labor organizations indicated concern that he had sat on that panel. Uh, since Ring has a similar list that he just disclosed, I believe, last week of clients who he would be recusing himself from as part of his ethics agreement, um, there has been similar concern that issues might arise if he is appointed. I frankly don't think they're going anywhere, but it is something that has come up. In addition to the appointments to the board, uh, President Trump also was able to appoint a new general counsel to replace Richard Griffin, who was the general counsel for the last part of the Obama administration. Peter Robb um, was appointed by the president to a four-year term and was confirmed by the Senate. He is in a position that is independent from the board. The general counsel is not on the board, but instead is responsible for the investigation and prosecution of unfair labor practice charges and the supervision of the National Labor Relations Board field offices. So I'm located in Milwaukee, there is an office here. He is responsible for overseeing um, that office, which has as its regional director, an individual who sits in Minneapolis. Those offices are um, supervised by the general counsel and he gives them direction, his office and his staff as to initiatives and priorities for um, the offices as the prosecuting cases. He was previously uh, an attorney actually at the board for five years. So he does have some experience at the board and was chief counsel to former board member Robert Hunter for a few years. However, like Emmanuel and Ring, he uh, most recently was a management side labor and employment attorney at a New England law firm. So the trend has been for Trump to appoint individuals into key positions at the board who um, know employment issues, who know employer side practical realities. We think that the impact of these changes is going to be uh, 
hopefully uh, cases and precedents that are more employer friendly, of course, we'll have to see how that plays out. But the good news is, at least when we had a three pa panel or three member um, majority uh, in December, we did see that play out in favor of employers. And we can now turn to the next part of our discussion, uh, which is going to be the joint employer status and what has happened regarding that status and the standard. Yeah, thank you very much, Judy. Um, obviously, with the change in administration, there is not only a change in all the names and faces, um, but particularly with this uh, going from Democrat to Republican, we've seen a, we've already seen changes with some of the substantive law, and that's what Steve and I are going to talk about. So the first thing um, that I'd like to discuss is the the joint employment issue, and. I want, uh, let's, let's keep in mind that joint employment as a concept isn't new. Uh, it's, it's, it's risen to the forefront in recent years, largely uh, for a couple of reasons. There is, um, in the marketplace, there is increased use of um, shared labor, or staffed labor, temporary labor, not only in, um, in, in you know, rank and file positions, but also in the supplement management positions. And in response to that, largely in President Obama's second term, we saw his administration, his agencies, issuing a lot of decisions that uh, were taking the concept of joint employment and pushing it in a more, more employee-friendly way. We saw it with the National Labor Relations Act, and we saw it in several other areas. And so let's let's make sure that we're all on the same page here in terms of what joint employment means. Joint employment it, it exists when uh, an employee is considered to be employed by two or more employers, such that both of those employers are responsible individually and jointly to the employee for compliance with the law. So, uh, in a real basic sense, outside of the National Labor Relations Act, if you've got uh, one employee, and then that employee has, let's call them their direct employer, but then there is, let's refer to it as a putative joint employer, which would be a second entity that through you know, several different ways might be involved in the mix. If, for example, that direct employer fails to pay um, statutory overtime, that joint employer could be, due, uh, could be liable, to, liable to pay that statutory overtime as well. And so you can sort of quickly see how joint employment can uh, become very concerning for lots of employers because one entity could be on the hook for another entity's bad acts. The issues um, or areas in which joint employment arises, it's, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of companies and employers where you, you, you've got your own employees and you really aren't involved in um, staffing employees or leasing employees or anything like that. So, you know, that issue might not come up for you so often, but increasingly lots of employers are using leased or contract employees or temporary employees. Also, if there is common control over several entities by the same um, sort of corporate overhead, and those various entities are drawing on, on a pool of employees. For example, uh, employees might work at you know, one location 20 hours a week and another, at another location 30 hours a week, even if those are sort of distinct uh, legal entities. If there is shared control in terms of op operations, HR, supervision, et cetera, those two entities could be deemed joint employers. And uh, from an industry-specific perspective, joint employment pops up, or the the issue of it has been pushed quite a bit recently in the franchisor franchisee context, and that's largely because you know franchisors provide a lot of guidance um, to franchisees in terms of how to help the franchisees run their own businesses, um, and and um, that franchisors certainly reserve a lot of control to manage the brand standards of their franchisees and questions come up which is in doing so is a franchisor becoming a joint employer of a franchisee the laws 
um, under which a putative joint employer or the concept of joint employment can arise are you know, essentially any employment law. Today we're talking about the National Labor Relations Act. So if a putative joint employer is held liable um, as a joint employer with a direct employer, that joint employer could be liable for the unfair labor practices committed by the direct employer. That joint employer could have an obligation to engage in collective bargaining with and to provide information to uh, labor organizations representing the direct employer's employees. And that joint employer could have an obligation to allow union activity on the property of the joint employer. You see a number of other laws. Uh, Fair Labor Standards Act regulates wages, uh, overtime, minimum wages, and then a number of other laws where joint employment concepts can come up. We're not going to get into each of these, obviously, today, uh, but the thing to keep in mind is that each of these laws has its own joint employment test. Turning to what has recently happened with the National Labor Relations Board, as you will all likely recall, just somewhat recently in August 2015, the Obama Board issued a decision in the Browning-Ferris case which held that two or more entities were joint employers of the same employees for labor relations purposes, and that means under the National Labor Relations Act, if they share or, or co-determine those matters, uh, the HR matters governing the essential terms and conditions of employment based on the employer's right of control, which could include direct, I'm sorry, which could include indirect control, regardless of the exercise of actual control. And it's those those final two sentences or lines on the screen which gave a lot of secondary employers or putative joint employers significant concern because this concept of indirect control or um, regardless of the exercise of actual control, I think you know people can sort of tangibly understand that if you are controlling the terms and conditions of a group of of workers that it is likely you would be held to be their employer, even if there is sort of a leasing um, or staffing relationship. Uh, but this, this Browning-Ferris test was um, very sort of unclear in the sense of it didn't define what indirect control meant. In the franchisor, franchisee industry, lots of franchisors certainly have influence and in indirect control over franchisees. Um, and in fact, we saw that play out with the National Labor Relations Board filing its charge against McDonald's Corporation seeking to hold McDonald's uh, liable for the unfair labor practices of several of McDonald's franchisees. In December 2017, in uh, the high brand industrial contractors matter, the now changing and newly constituted National Labor Relations Board, without mincing its words, overturned the Browning-Ferris standard and returned to pre-Browning-Ferris precedent. So now the test is what it had been for several decades leading up till 2015, and that is that putative joint employers must have exercised control over the essential employment terms rather than merely having reserved the right to do so. The control must be direct and immediate rather than indirect. And the joint employment status will not be found if there is sort of limited and routine influence by a putative joint employer. This obviously brings back years of precedent uh, under the National Labor Relations Board decisions that existed prior to Browning Ferris. But it's also not a get out of jail free card. In fact, in the hybrid industrial contractors decision, the two entities there were actually held to be joint employers. And so it's important to think if you're a franchisor or if you work in an industry where there is staffing and leased and temporary employees or contracted employees, think about ways in which um, to the extent your goal is to avoid a joint employment relationship, how you might do that. And there's two big things you want to think about. 
you want to think about one getting the paperwork right and two getting the practices right so in terms of the paperwork when you're contracting with another entity um, whether whatever the context might be if you're going to be um, receiving staff um, staffed labor or if you're going to be supplementing your workforce with staffed labor and your goal is to avoid joint employment issues then you want to make sure that in your contracting documents it's clearly established which entities control the terms and conditions of employment uh, and you want to make sure that you specify which entities are responsible for complying with the applicable employment law that's getting the paperwork right and then on the other hand you have to make sure that the practices are right because as we know from any any sort of employment um, issue that can arise, you can you can paper it all you want, but a court or an administrative agency or an agency, um, federal or state agency is going to always look at what are the sort of practical realities. And so to the extent you are an entity seeking to avoid a joint employer finding, you need to be very cautious. Um, you need to make sure that you are not exercising control or influencing significantly the essential terms and conditions of another entity's employment and that means another entity's employees and that means that you're not involved in hiring firing disciplining you're not involved in establishing wages or working conditions you're not controlling the day-to-day -day work environment of the other entity's employees you're not involved in establishing hours of work staffing or scheduling you know, largely those HR type things, you need to stay away from that um, because those are the types of things. Now, typically it's not gonna just be one thing. It's not gonna be just one sort of touch that would result in a joint employer finding. It would have to be, it would be looked at on a whole. Um, and so the more you uh, stay away from these sorts of things and allow the other entity to run its own business, to supervise its own employees, to make hiring and firing decisions of its own employees, then that will reduce the likelihood of a joint employer finding. I'll turn it over to Steve to talk about some of other some of the other recent exciting NLRB <laughs> decisions. Yes, thank you, Chris. And um, as exciting as High Brand was uh, in overturning Browning Ferris, um, the board issued a number of other significant decisions on the last two days of uh, former chair Ms. Kamara's. Um, days on the board. I believe it was December 14th and 15th, the uh, week before Christmas. I like to call it uh, member Ms. Kamara's Christmas presents to employers, I think. Um, and these decisions address employee handbooks, micro bargaining units, um, and an employer's ability to make without bargaining unilateral changes consistent with its past practice. And anyone who followed um, uh, Chairman Ms. Kamara or former Chairman Ms. Kamara during his time um, while it was an Obama board majority, um, he wrote a number of um, sort of scathing dissents, uh, for lack of a better term, and they hit on a lot of these issues. So the fact that he addressed them um, and overturned uh, with the board majority um, the decisions relating to them before he left was not a, a significant uh, or huge surprise. So we're going to go through each of these um, decisions, talk about the old standards, that was in place and how it had been imply, applied under the Obama board and the former uh, general counsel. And now um, the new standard and how we anticipate it will be applied and, and sort of things to consider on your end um, as you're dealing with these new rules and standards. So first we're gonna talk about um, the new standard on employee handbook rules and um, employment policy. And, um, we start with a looking back at what was established under Lutheran Heritage. Lutheran Heritage was a 2004 decision um, which set in place the standard that the Obama board applied and was enforced by former general counsel uh, relating to employment rules and handbook policies. And the test that was used there was, was simple and it basically was that um, if a rule or an employment policy could be reasonably construed by an employee to prohibit Section 7 rights, then it violated the NLRA. Now, that was a simple rule, simple in practice, right? Um, no, not at all. <laughs> As any of you know, um, it was it was terrible to try and deal with. Um, you know, 
the board was constantly finding that very uh, common policies such as civility policies, you know, treat one another with respect, um, respect your supervisors, that those could reasonably be construed to uh, hinder Section 7 rights and violated the NLRA. Um, it was very difficult uh, when drafting employment policies to know whether or not um, your non-solicitation, your workplace conduct rules would be found to violate the NLRA. Um, and one of the biggest critiques that was raised by former chairman, Ms. Kamara, was that the rule and the application of it did not in any way um, take into consideration employers' rights versus employees' rights. He found it to be completely based on an employee's uh, subjective view and did not consider why an employer would put certain rules in place and its right to do so under the act. So with that sort of background in mind and a lot of those critiques raised about how Lutheran heritage had been applied under the Obama board, um, the decision in the Boeing company was not a significant surprise. Um, so the Boeing company overturned, the Boeing company decision overturned Lutheran heritage and established a new standard that the board is going to apply um, and it applied in Boeing company. So it applied retroactively um, and, and that is, that the board is now going to look at two factors when assessing a rule. Um, those two factors are the nature and extent of the potential impact on NLA, NLRA rights um, of the rule, and then it's going to balance that against the legitimate justification that the employer has asserted um, for putting the rule in place. And this is a balancing test that considers both, both of these uh, interests of the employer and the employee, and the board has said that after it engages in this balancing analysis, that it will result in rules being placed into three different categories. Um, and there are category one rules, there will be category two rules, and there will be category three rules. So first are category one rules. And what category one rules are, these are the rules that the board has said are ones that cannot be reasonably interpreted to prohibit or interfere with workers' rights, or so there's there can be two types of category one rules, or rules that may have a slight adverse impact on protected NLRA rights, but they are outweighed by business justification. So the example that the board gave in the Boeing decision was civility standards, that these may have a slight impact on um, employees' rights to uh, engage in protected activity, but employers justifications for putting them in place and having them in their handbook greatly outweigh whatever slight uh, effect they have on Section 7 rights. So these would constitute civility standards would constitute a category one type rule. Category two type rules is where I like to say the board has punted basically. Um, these are rules that the board has said warrant further scrutiny as to whether they prohibit or inter interfere with NLRA rights. Um, and if so, whether the adverse impact is outweighed by business justification. The board gave no examples of what a category two rule might be. Um, so I think, and as we'll talk about a little bit more, we're left, you know, we're, we're gonna have to wait and see what comes um, and what the board is putting in this category. Um, I think you will know it when we see it, basically is the board's take on it. Um, and I think they're going to use this as a way to get out of some probably tricky factual situations that may um, come up in the future. The final category, category three rules, are rules that the board has said are clearly unlawful because they interfere with workers' rights in a manner that is not outweighed by any business um, justification or interest that an employer may assert. The example that the board gave in Boeing of a clear category three rule is a policy prohibiting employees from discussing wages or benefits with one another. Obviously, we've known even under um, any other board or under any other standard that's been applied to handbook rules um, that this would violate the NLRA clearly. Um, so this type of a, a rule um, should not become, is not much of a shock. Um, and I think to the extent you have um, non-solicitation policies that only prohibit um, employees from engaging in union related activities, that's the type of rule that would fall into category three based on what the board has said thus far. 
the board gave additional guidance as it relates to this new standard because it is in fact a new standard um, and what it said as it relates to the categories themselves uh, it said these are classification of results um, the categories are not a part of the actual balancing test itself so the board will engage in the balancing and then it will as a result of the balancing place these rules into one of three categories um, the categories are supposed to help employers know what type of rules moving forward um, are clearly compliant with the NLRA, what type of rules are clearly not compliant with the NLRA, and what rules are, I guess, in the gray area where you um, may have some risk in, um, in putting them in place. Um, but the aim of the categories is to give employers further guidance um, in crafting rules and, um, and, and putting them in place. The board did go on to note and, and caution employers that simply because you maintain a rule that may be lawful, so you have a category one um, non-solicitation rule that is lawful on its face, um, if you apply it in a way that violates the NLRA, um, you will still be have found to have violated the NLRA. And that really shouldn't come as much of a shock. Um, if you have a, for example, a non-solicitation policy that on its face um, applies to all forms of solicitation and would be um, compliant with the NLRA and it's, it's facially neutral, but if you only apply it when employees engage in Section 7 type activity or solicitation, then you violated the NLRA. And that, that isn't anything to do with the rule or the way it's written, it's your application of it. So that has always been in place, but the board made clear in Boeing that that is still the case and that's how they will um, apply these rules going forward. Um, and so how that actually shook out in Boeing um, and how it was applied, what Boeing had was a no camera rule, which prohibited employees um, from using camera devices to capture images or videos without a business need or an approved camera permit from the company. Um, the board uh, did a balancing of the standard. Um, they applied the balancing standard to the rule and said, um, that the rule's potential impact on employees' ability to engage in protected activity was minimal here. And it was greatly outweighed by Boeing's business justifications um, for having it, which was, in this instance, their primary one was national security concerns, right? They're an airplane manufacturer. Um, it was incredibly important to them to, you know, not have images leak of parts that were being developed or things that, um, could potentially be tampered with uh, in relation to national security issues. And um, the board said their justification for this rule was um, quite clear and certainly outweighed the employees' um, Section 7 rights here. And so they categorized it as a Category 1 rule that was compliant with the NLRA. Now, um, before we move on to micro bargaining units, the thing to keep in mind about this is. Although the board's goal is to provide more clarity, I still think we are in a position where there is some ambiguity here and we don't know exactly how the board is going to apply this test in all circumstances. And you know, um, while you can, I think you can feel more confident the board is going to be much less aggressive and the GC is going to be much less aggressive in pursuing handbook or rule related uh, violations than it was under the Obama board. Um, there is still a chance, obviously, that um, if your rules are slightly ambiguous, um, that they could be categorized in a Category 2 function, or if they're clearly not compliant with the NLRA, that they would be labeled as Category 3 rules. So um, moving on from employer rules uh, and handbook rules, we're now going to talk about micro bargaining units. And um, how this came up is in specialty healthcare which was a 2011 decision under the Obama board. Um, the board at that time held that an employer who's challenging a proposed bargaining unit has to show that excluded employees share an overwhelming community of interest if they wanted to effectively challenge the proposed bargaining unit. Um, this was a significant deviation from the prior standard that had been in place for years. And in effect, it allowed unions to organize much smaller bargaining units in workforces where they lack support from a majority of a larger, say, hourly workforce. 
Um, and Macy's was a great example of that. Macy's was a 2014 board decision. Um, they denied the employer's challenge to the proposed bargaining unit and said that it was an appropriate unit based on the new standard that was established. And there, the bargaining unit was composed of only 41 cosmetic and fragrance department sales uh, employees, as opposed to all of the sales employees at Macy's. And, um, you know, this gave unions, uh, they loved this decision because they could come into workforces where they previously knew or, or had, you know, a good idea that they weren't going to be able to get majority of support, but could find disaffected units of employees who they could um, get majority support from. And unless the employer could show that there was an overwhelming community of interest between those employees and the rest of either hourly employees um, or potential bargaining members, the union would succeed on its petition um, and succeed with that bargaining unit. So um, this caused a lot of concern um, and it got uh, drew a lot of ire from former chairman, Ms. Gamara, um, which is why you see the PCC structural decision. And so in PCC structurals, the board overturned specialty health care and it returned to the previous standard that was in place, which was a community interest standard to assess whether um, a petition for bargaining unit was appropriate. And so that new standard, um, new or more of a readopted standard was uh, or is do the petitioned employees share a community of interest that's sufficiently distinct from the interest of excluded employees to warrant their own unit. And it puts the um, analysis back on the board as opposed to really a burden that was placed on the employer um, under the previous standard. And you know the board made clear here um, that it may find exclusion of certain employees from petition for units inappropriate, even when the excluded employees do not share an overwhelming of community interest with employees. So um, the new standard will make it much more difficult for unions to carve out smaller department-sized units that omit certain employees who, um, under the lesser standard, share a community of interest with the petition for unit um, and have no interest in joining a union. So this is obviously a very, very employer uh, friendly decision. And um, how it played out in PCC structurals, the board found that it was um, inappropriate, the petition for unit, um, which only included 100 welders and rework specialists, um, and that the unit should have included all 2,500 hourly employees uh, who worked at. Uh, PCC's company facility. So I think this is a decision that is very favorable, um, will give employers a lot more support in challenging attempted micro units from um, unions uh, in the future. And finally, the last decision um, that we're going to talk about before I turn it back to Judy is um, the board's recent decision regarding past practice and unilateral changes. And I think here it helps to go through a little history. So the whole the whole reason this issue arises is um, uh, uh, regarding what what type of duty an employer has to bargain and when that duty arises. So um, it comes uh, from you know what constitutes a change in employment conditions that requires an employer to provide notice to the union and an opportunity to bargain. And um, from a 1960s Supreme Court decision in Cass. Um, the Supreme Court made clear that an employer cannot make unilateral changes to terms and conditions of employment unless the employer first informs the union of the proposed modification and gives the union an opportunity to bargain over it. That's very standard and that's been in place since 1962. Um, and then came a very uh, helpful board decision for employers in Shell Oil, which um, the board there said Modification to an employment term is not a change under CAS that requires notice and the opportunity to bargain if it is consistent with the employer's past practice. So um, an employer did not have to provide notice and opportunity to bargain if the change it, it decided to make was consistent with things that it had done previously. In 2016, the board overturned that very long um, long-standing precedent from Shell Oil in DuPont. And the board issued a brand new standard, which basically said that a change 
under cap. So a change that must be preceded by notice to the union opportunity to bargain includes occurrences when an employer acts uh, in line with its past practice, practice and does what it previously had done um, in situations where CBA, you know, permitted the employer's past actions and the CBA had expired. It also went on to say that notice and the opportunity to bargain would always be required when the employer's action or decision involves any type of discretion. And this element, I mean, both elements of the decision were, um, were very upsetting to Chairman Mr. but that um, he found particularly challenging because he said, you know, this defies common sense and basically any type of any type of decision involves some level of discretion and this would be impossible for um, for employers to follow and that they would always have to be giving notice and an opportunity to bargain any type of decision they make. So with that background, we get to Raytheon. Um, which was this, the final decision the board majority uh, issued before member, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Marsh stepped down. And, you know, the board did not mince words there, said DuPont is fun fundamentally flawed, distorted longstanding precedent and <laughs> common sense principles. They overturned it and returned back to the Shell oil standard. So the readopted standard from Shell, Shell oil is that an employer's pra practice is a term and condition of employment that permits the employer to take actions unilaterally that do not materially vary in kind or degree from what has been its custom in the past. And the board also noted, which I think is very helpful, that it's irrelevant whether that past practice was developed under a CBA that contained a management rights clause authorizing unilateral employer action. So even if that did not exist um, and the act was consistent with past practice and didn't materially vary from it, the board said that that still would not be a change that required notice and an opportunity to bargain. Um, and how that played out in Raytheon is um, just background on the fact, um, the CBA had expired and while the union was, um, was working on bargaining a new contract, Raytheon made unilateral changes to the bargaining unit uh, employees health plans in January of 2013, which it had done every year from 2001 to 2012. It did not notify the union of this change and it did not provide them an opportunity to bargain over it. And the board here applying the Shell Oil readopted standards said there was not a change that Raytheon did that required notice and opportunity to bargain because this modification overall was consistent with their past practice. It did not vary greatly from the changes that had been made in the 12 previous years. Um, the changes were made at the same time of the year and the changes applied to union, unionized and non-unionized employees alike. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think again, very employer friendly decision, um, give the employers the right when um, they are outside of the, when they're out, out of that time period, um, to act consistently with past practice and institute changes without having to notify the union and giving them an opportunity to bargain. That said, what the board made very clear and what I wanna make very clear as well here is that even though we have the Shell Oil Standard which permits employers to act uh, under past practice, if the employer, if you get a request from a bargain to bargain over an issue from the union and it's a mandatory subject of bargaining, you have to engage in bargaining over that subject. So. This decision um, does not obviate your obligation to do that. It still exists. And um, you know the board made very clear that if you refuse to um, trying to rely on past practice or something of that nature after the union has requested to bargain over it, um, you will be found to have violated the NLRA. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to Judy and she is going to talk about uh, the recent GC memorandum and what we can expect from that moving forward. Great. So in December of 2007, December 1 to be exact, the General Counsel issued a memorandum uh, which was uh, in reference to mandatory submissions to advice and which was sent to all regional directors and officers. The memorandum was not unusual in and of itself as it follows the tradition of past NLRB General Counsels who have issued mandatory submission memos offering similar priority insights. The purpose of the memo is the uh, role of the general counsel, who is to act as the board's gatekeeper, 
the general counsel has unreviewable discretion in the issuance of complaints based on charges filed with the agency. So essentially, the general counsel gets to decide ultimately whether a complaint will be issued if there's any question about whether that is going to occur. The submission memo um, provided that all cases involving significant legal issues need to be submitted to the Division of Advice. The Division of Advice is part of the Office of the General Counsel and is charged with providing guidance to the board's regional offices regarding difficult and novel issues arising in the processing of unfair labor practice charges and is also responsible for coordinating the initiation and litigation of injunction proceedings. So the memo itself is identifying for the regional offices who are located throughout the country particular areas where they are supposed to seek guidance from the Division of Advice. Now, interestingly enough, the memo does state that regional offices are to continue issuing complaints where issuance is appropriate under current board law, but they're also to seek direction and guidance from advice before filing complaints on how to present the issues to the administrative law judges, the board, and the courts will ultimately hear or decide the complaint. Now, that's interesting because um, some general counsels who have disagreed with prior precedents have taken the viewpoint that they're going to essentially exercise prosecutorial discretion, and if they disagree with a past precedent, just not issue a complaint at all. The memo suggests that that is not the direction that this general counsel is taking, that he is instead going to have complaints issued based on the old law, but also assert alternative theories. Now, that's good and bad for employers. It's not great for you if you are the first employer who has this issue because you are still going to be subjected to a hearing and litigation cost in getting to a decision that might have better precedent for you. It's good for the employers who are on the sidelines watching and hoping for that precedent because they will not have to worry about um, hoping that the regional office will ignore precedent but hopefully we'll be able to get precedents themselves that they can rely upon in avoiding prosecutions in the first instance. So what are significant legal issues? There are three categories that the general counsel has identified as being legal issues that must be submitted to the division of advice. Uh, they include cases that involve issues over the last eight years that overruled precedent and involved one or more dissents, cases involving issues the board has not yet decided, and any other cases that the region believes will be of importance to the general counsel. Now, interestingly, in the memo, and perhaps not surprisingly, one of the preliminary statements by the general counsel is that the last eight years have seen many changes in precedent, often with vigorous dissent. So that first category appears to directly tie into the Obama administration's board and its activist stance in the last eight years and a desire to potentially rein in some of those precedents. Now, the general counsel has also made clear that he will not be rebriefing cases um, that are currently pending before the courts unless directed by the board or courts. And that's interesting because many of the board's most significant decisions have already made themselves up to the court system. We don't anticipate that there is going to be any change, for instance, in DR Horton, which is a board case that found employers violate the National Labor Relations Act by requiring employees as a condition of employment to arbitrate rather than litigate in court their participation in class actions. Uh, that case actually was heard by the Supreme Court already, and we anticipate we will receive a decision in that case from the Supreme Court. However, the statement by the general counsel that they will not be rebriefing cases in some events is misleading, or in some cases is misleading, for example, the Joint Employer Standard, Browning-Ferris, that, that case was actually in front of the court until December after the Browning-Ferris decision was overturned or precedent was overturned by the board, the court decided to remand it to the board for further briefing and consideration. So even though there's not going to be this proactive approach of rebriefing cases, it's very likely that as precedents change, if there are still court cases pending, you may see see a request by the board or um, determinations by the courts themselves to remand the cases for further consideration. Um, the memo also identifies specific issues and lines of cases that must be submitted to advice. And those uh, lines of cases really follow that first category of decisions or cases that um, 
involve issues over the last eight years on which a dissent was filed. Now, some of the very specific topics listed in the memo as being areas on which uh, advice needs to be uh, sought are joint employer relationships, use of employers' email systems for union activity, and cases in which handbook policies were found to interfere with National Labor Relations Act rights. Since the issuance of the memo, which was December 1, 2017, as Chris and Steve have already explained, we have actually seen the precedents change in two of those categories, the joint employer relationship category and handbook policies. Now, with regard to use of employers' email systems, that is based upon the Purple Communications uh, case from 2014, where the board held employees have a presumptive right to use an employer's email system to engage in Section 7 activity. The memo suggests that the board is going to, or the general counsel's office is going to be suggesting that uh, alternative theories and alternative standards actually be um, implemented with regard to such usage. Now, the good news is if you are an employer, you can know from the memo that this uh, precedent is not going to be expanded. Richard Griffin, the prior general counsel, had as a specific initiative that he wanted to expand purple communications to other types of electronic communications. The council memo makes clear that that initiative is off the table. So you will not need to be worrying about expansion to other areas under electronic, um, under purple communications. Other areas specifically listed include the definition of concerted activity for mutual aid and protection and cases involving obscene, vulgar, or other highly inappropriate conduct. Once again, these relate to specific cases under the Obama board in which the Obama board expanded um, mutual aid and protection to include potentially individual um, claims. The case that issue there involved uh, individual sexual harassment claim, fresh and easy neighborhood market, and requesting assistance with that claim was found to be protected activity. Uh, the second category, obscene, vulgar, highly inappropriate conduct, refers to the Pier 60 case in which an employee posted a highly vulgar, expletive-laden Facebook post, um, but then at the end said, but yes for the union. And the board found that that was protected conduct. So it's clear that the general counsel is going to be seeking to um, probably pull back the protections to employees in these areas. Other areas of mandatory submissions include work stoppages, restrictions on employee access to employer property, and Weingarten rights. Now, the Weingarten rights issue is interesting. Weingarten applies to your, the unionized employer, employers in the audience and requires that you will provide union representation if an employee requests it during an investigatory interview that might lead to discipline. That um, standard, the Weingarten standard, does not apply to non-unionized employers currently. <clears throat> there have been times in the past where it has, and the Obama Board General Counsel, uh, Richard Griffin, had an initiative to expand it. Uh, once again, the General Counsel memo makes clear that you guys will not need to be worrying about expansion to the non-union context. So the non-union employers can take some comfort in the fact that, at least for the next few years, they're probably not going to have to worry about wine garden rights. For the union employers in our audience, um, the memo also makes clear that the board is that the general counsel is going to be looking at proposing changes in the standard for application of wine garden in the drug testing context which is also an expansion under the obama board uh, some other areas that we that the uh memo indicates need to be submitted to the general counsel uh, council's uh, department or division of advice include disparate treatment of represented employees union claims that an employer is the successor of a predecessor disclosure of witness statements to the union and dues checkoff provisions. Um, once again, we saw a broadening of the standards that created more protections for employees and more rights for unions um, in these areas. The disclosure of witness statements to unions is in reference to the Piedmont Gardens case that overruled 30 years of precedence. Precedence uh, previously um, in prior, prior boards uh, statements usually do not need to be provided to a union. In Piedmont Gardens, the board changed that standard to require a balancing test um, and essentially proof by the employer that there were confidentiality reasons which uh, required that the statement not be provided. So it looks like we're going to be seeing some changes in that standard and potentially changes in the dues checkoff provisions and reverting to prior precedent, which stated that such provisions did not continue following expiration of a collective bargaining agreement. 
couple of final areas um, where we where we um, see in the memo requests for uh, issues to be submitted to the Division of Advice include expansions of available remedies to employees, including reimbursement for job and other interim employment expenses, and requiring employers who unlawfully withheld uh, dues payments to pay them to the union without being able to go back to the uh, employees for the payment of those dues. So these areas are important because we know now that this is the type of issue that the general counsel is interested in potentially changing the standards regarding. Now, the standards have not yet changed. So you need to be aware that if you go and make changes in these areas or engage in conduct that still violates um, precedent that has currently been set, you are potentially subject to a charge. <clears throat> Although hopefully the board will be opposing or positing an alternative theory that would make it less likely that you're ultimately found to have violated the act. One or two other things to keep in mind, the memo does rescind some former general counsel memoranda, including the deferral to arbitration memoranda, which said that it was not appropriate to defer to arbitration if it would take longer than a year for that process to conclude, as well as a memorandum um, suggesting that graduate students and student athletes should be treated as employees. While not in the materials, I also did want to mention the quickie election rules. The uh, rules for elections changed under the Obama administration so that um, we now have a situation where uh, the time period between, um, between the uh, time of a notice of petition being filed and an election occurring is very uh, limited. And that combined with the micro unit uh, precedent in the past really allowed for unions to go in and try to quickly organize very specific groups and then to catch employers off guard. There is now um, public comment being sought on those rules and we expect that there might be some tweaks in how those operate and that those changes most likely would be beneficial to employers, although we haven't seen anything yet as public comment period first closes in February. So that's been a lot of information. Mm -hmm. There might be some questions out there. Uh, I think that there were a couple of questions for um, joint employer status. So Chris, if you want to deal with those, and if you could repeat the question so that everybody can uh, understand what you're answering, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Judy. Um, one of the questions is relating to uh, franchisors and the element of control. And so for example, if a franchisor requires that franchisees employees enter into non-competes or that the franchisees ensure a drug-free workplace how does that fall on the scale of joint employment um, there with particularly in the franchise or franchisee context there's often going to be a tension between brand standards and what do we do to maintain conformity consistency and to ensure that our independently owned and operated franchisees are who run their own business but are nonetheless providing products and services that are consistent with everyone else who runs their own business under our franchise model. And so to some degree, you know, franchisors have to, you know, take a take a step, they have to step into the joint employer foray to some degree because they, you know, it, the evaluation of what's an important brand standard is paramount. Now um, particularly with franchisors, there have been a number of states that have passed laws recently uh, indicating that franchisors and franchisees will not be held jointly liable. Um, of course, that's only going to relate to state laws. And you, uh, the franchisors, have a very active lobbying organization in Washington, D.C., which is doing everything it can. With respect to these two specific questions, um, non-competes the I, I would be careful there uh particularly to the extent you're influencing the um, the um ability to work for a franchisee employee with respect to managers or other supervisors who work at a franchisee that's a little bit different because let's keep in mind that uh, managers and supervisors fall outside of the protections of the National Labor Relations Act, and so you'll, you know, you can sort of influence their terms and conditions a little bit more uh, significantly without 
wading into the NLRA issue. Um, but with respect to the franchisees employees, I would be very careful to, you know, I mean, you could certainly, you know, talk with the franchisees and, and say that, you know, they might want to, you might ask them to think about whether they need non-competes to run their business or um, the, make a, you know, a, a offer it as a suggestion, but I, I, I probably wouldn't impose that on the rank and file employees. And in terms of a drug-free workplace, um, that one is, you know, that one's a little bit different. It's it's sort of a work environment. Um, I, I don't see that tipping very strongly on the scales of, of joint employment if, as a franchisor, you were asked to, you ask franchisees to main, maintain drug-free workplaces, particularly if there is a compelling need to maintain a drug-free workplace. It's 11 o'clock, so I just want to note that um, that is the case. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to extend this in case uh, we have a few more questions and get those answered. Um, but I do want to invite everybody, or I wanted to thank everybody for attending the webinar and to invite you to contact us directly if we may be of further assistance. Um, but we will continue on for those who want to stay on for a few more minutes and answering some additional questions. I think, Steve, there was a question or two on the handbook policies if you want to address those. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions was, um, was there any reference or guidance to employer social media policies in the um, Boeing decision establishing the new uh, handbook rules and standards um, that's going to be applied by the board? Uh, in the board's actual decision, there was not. Um, but in the footnotes of the decision that supported the majority's analysis, um, which basically said that the application of Lutheran heritage, the old standard, was um, incredibly problematic, very hard for employers uh, to understand. The supporting materials that they gave for that was citing to a lot of law review articles, a lot of commentary regarding how that rule was applied to social media rules. Um, so I think gleaning from that, um, it, while the board didn't specifically address it, it's certainly an area that's on their radar that I think we could see categorized uh, potentially based on how the rule's written as a category one rule. Um, I, again, there's been no decision on it. The board didn't specifically say that, but based on how heavily they cited to the confusion um, around social media rules that were um, very commonplace and were intended to um, prevent employees from engaging in harassing behavior online or behavior that um, greatly disparaged the company um, online. Uh, I think, you know, we will see a change there based on what the board cited in its uh, supporting decision. And um, another um, question was regarding Boeing, again, on the handbook, what is the likelihood that, th that this decision would allow the prevention of cameras in the workplace for a medical company that has a lot of uh, PHI present in its work areas. And um, I think, you know, at what the board here is intending that this no camera rule um, is a category one type rule. Um, I think if you have the justifications like here, um, that there are, there's a lot of confidential information that would put things at risk if it was disclosed, um, you know, that 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 would be problematic and that your justification for having that rule in place outweighs the Section 7 rights that it might interfere on, um, and that's the intention of the category system. So I do think a rule like that in place would fall into the category one um, after going through the analysis based on the justifications asserted here um, and for that industry. Um, no other questions that okay. I've received. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you want to do your question? Sure, yeah, there was one other question that asked about the joint employment issue in staffing firms. Um, how does this work, particularly where um, we bring in staffing employees and they're working on site? So, um, you know, the Browning Ferris decision itself was actually about um, a staffing firm. It, it, it was about uh, an entity that supplemented it work, its workforce with leased employees. and. You know, there there can be a lot of variety here, but you know, so what, one way to one easy way to think of this is, if you're an employer and you bring in a receptionist on a temporary basis to fill a role from a staffing um, perspective, um, if we if we look at some of the other laws, you know, we might not think of her as our employee, but we're certainly controlling the work environment. We're giving her the day-to-day -day work. Um, we may not be setting the wages because that might be contracted out. 
And so, like I said, joint employment issues can arise under a lot of laws. So think of it like this, you, you, you can't make discriminatory decisions against that receptionist just because she came from a staffing firm. Um, you probably would be viewed as a joint employer for the purposes of, of Title VII because you're clearly controlling the work environment. If you supplement your workforce, if you are a builder and you supplement your workforce on site with leased employees, um, it, it, to the extent you, if you, if you're seeking to avoid a joint employer finding, then you'll want to ensure that the firm providing the employees has its own on-site supervisors, has its own, uh, makes its own decisions over who's hiring and firing um, the the staffing employees. And so, and those are the types of things that's going to weigh against a joint employer finding. Whereas if, if it is someone who is, you know, basically filling a, a spot role of, of, of what is normal, what is normal, normally performed in the work environment, there is a decent chance that at least under certain of these laws, you could be found as a joint employer, for example, the anti-discrimination laws. But under the new National Labor Relations Board test, it's less likely that you would be found as a joint employer for National Labor Relations Act purposes. Um, and also there, you know, temporariness and permanency is a factor too. I mean, it, someone's not gonna really be trying to, you know, might not share a community of interest or trying to unionize um, uh, against you where they're in a, a uh, three month receptionist role. So it, it, it always requires an analysis of what, what sort of law are we looking at and what are the issues. I think that's all the questions we had. Once again, thank you if you stayed on for the extra few minutes to hear the responses and feel free to contact Chris, Steve, or I with any other questions you might have. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.